Welcome to our presentation on the challenges and benefits of an experiential project-based ESL curriculum. Uh, we're Sylvia Kozlowska, Mark Makino, Rob McCalm, Jason Sander, and Kirsten Stevens from the American Language and Culture Center at Southern Utah University. The goal of our presentation is to help you understand how you might be able to adapt project-based learning components into your English language curriculum. So we'll start off by having Jason define project-based learning. Uh, he'll talk about some of the goals and the benefits and components of such a program. Then Sylvia will follow up with some examples of how we've implemented project-based learning in our ESL curriculum with our intensive English program. And then Mark and Kirsten will talk about some of the challenges to implementing project-based learning in an IEP as well as ways that you can adapt the project-based learning models to fit the constraints of your English language program. Thank you, Rob, for that introduction. And welcome everyone to our presentation. My name is Jason Sander, and I am a full-time lecturer for the American Language and Culture Center here at Southern Utah University. Our presentation is going to begin by highlighting some goals and benefits of project-based learning, and hopefully uh, you can take away some ideas that are sparking some of your own creativity and you can implement some of these ideas in your own classroom. Let's begin. Uh, I've added a working definition of project-based learning for those of you who may be unfamiliar. Um, I'm assuming that many of you who are in attendance today are familiar with project-based learning, but here it is. I want to uh, uh, I want to focus on the real world impact aspect of project based learning. One of the things that can be kind of difficult in a classroom sometimes is connecting the skills that we learn in a classroom to a real world application. And the real world impact is seen almost instantly in these projects. Specifically, you'll see examples in the next section of this presentation. My colleague Sylvia Kozlowska is going to present. Um, some examples of projects. And I would like you uh, to remember this real world impact when you are seeing some of the projects that are related to community service. As far as connections between skills developed and practical contexts that are authentic, I think that is one of our goals with project-based le learning is to help take an abstract concept that you introduce in class and they actually get to go out and use it in the real world, see how it applies in an authentic setting or context. So as we were uh, integrating some of these project-based ideas into our curriculum for our IEP, uh, our first step was to align these ideas with our institutional outcomes. Uh, Southern Utah University has uh, quite a few actually that align uh, with our ideas and experiential learning is one of them. Um, connecting international students to the on-campus community as well as the community at large, the Cedar City community, and immersing international students' popular academic culture. Um, projects do this quite effectively, as you will see in the examples presented later in this presentation. Uh, I do want to mention that when we were integrating these project-based ideas into our curriculum, that uh, there was a project requirement for graduation. Uh, in the campus at large for our undergraduate students. That is no longer the case. However, um, there are still many people on, on campus, the SEU faculty and staff that do support uh, project-based learning and they do very much still use project-based learning in their own classrooms. So it's wonderful to have these people um, to ask questions and to collaborate. Now, critical project components. Um, I'm going to emphasize four of these, and the first one is your intrinsic inquiry. We start a project, and this is always the hardest day of the project, is when you ask students, what are your interests? What do you want to spend time researching? And um, for many of our students, the first time they've ever been asked the question, what are your interests? So this can be very daunting for students. So uh, some of the things that we would suggest is uh, start with a single day primer project during the first week. This helps identify what a project is for our students. Um, giving them guiding questions is also very helpful. You will see examples of, of some of the guiding questions we have used in the past in our courses. And of course, umbrella topics. Um, there will be more examples of these as well, but I just included a couple I've used in my own class. 
um, personal wellness, academic success, which are just two of many. Uh, the next step is a process of inquiry, um, core assignments. We do like to keep some core assignments consistent throughout our project-based levels. Um, one of such assignments is a project proposal, usually do um, by the end of the first week, depending on the class, or the second week, students start turning in their proposals. Uh, weekly progress updates and final project reflections. Um, prompts are usually provided for both the weekly progress updates and final project reflection. These reflections and updates oftentimes are, are they can come in multiple forms, oral, written, um, you'll see some examples. Uh, public sharing of a project is important. It, it provides some accountability for students and they also enjoy it. Um, we do something at the end of each term called mini conference. Uh, where students will make their presentations and the audience usually consists of faculty from campus, other students, people from the community, friends and family of the students uh, will come and support them and ask random questions about their projects. Um, they have to initiate discussion. There's a lot of language skill involved here and we do prepare them and they do have time to practice for this. As far as assessment, um, I had to adjust my language a bit whenever we would we'd be talking about projects in class because generally I used to talk about pass fail. I would use terms like pass fail. Uh, in a project based class, I, I, I adjusted that term to to be unsuccessful or successful. And it does have uh, an effect on the students when they think about I failed. That's it. No, in a project-based class, being unsuccessful, there's learning there if you reflect, and then the, the process starts over. If they go to a, another level or another project-based level, then they can try again. They can think about what worked last time, what didn't work, perhaps it was their, their topic, they didn't spend enough time or they didn't take it seriously. Um, they can make these adjustments. As far as benefits of project-based learning, uh, separated this out to three sections. We have uh, benefits for the learner, instructor, and campus and greater local community. I'd like to focus on just a couple of points when it comes to learner benefits, specifically uh, the lifelong learning and transferable skills. I think that through projects, oftentimes students get the opportunity to find out what their strengths and weaknesses are. And um, Oh, just to, to go back for a moment, transferable skills, some examples might be teamwork, flexibility, uh, time management, um, being reflective. And these are all, according to the literature coming out in the new research, when it comes to the future of the job market, many, of, many of employers are looking not just for people who have degrees or look good on paper, they're looking for people who have these skills, people who can show that they have acquired these skills. And through these more experiential and, and, and project-based modalities, we can, we can really exercise these skills. Um, students can practice them at their own pace. Uh, learner autonomy, and that's kind of connected to my next point. Actually, I'm gonna hold that for a moment. Instructor benefits. I'd like to skip down to student buy-in. Can overall foster student engagement. Um, this seems like, more of a learner benefit, but for as an instructor, it can be very difficult uh, to make these connections with students. And when you have students that have bought into the to their own project, they're intrinsically motivated. Um, oftentimes, they'll find out that they have skills they didn't realize they have, and they can share those skills with other students in the class. An example would be uh, maybe I have one student who's building a website. And they ask me, Jason, do you, can you help me with this? I've never built a website, but maybe we can ask other students. And inevitably, there's at least one or two that are pretty technically, uh, technologically savvy. So I can say, look, you're a community here. You can help each other. Um, and they do start to, to, start to trust each other. Um, it shifts the role of the teacher to facilitator. Instead of going up and, and fixing a problem on a student, uh, if they're having a technical problem on their computer, instead you can ask them questions. Well, have you tried? Instead of doing it for them or giving them the answer, um, have you talked to, have you asked, uh, have you gone to the library? 
I would suggest um, the role instead of just giving them information and answers is then shifted to facilitating uh, their questions. And oftentimes asking them questions and not just answering it can be very difficult for a teacher to adjust to this. And as far as you might be getting excited about this, this next part where it says reduces busy work. Don't get excited. Uh, you are still very busy. It's just in a different way. Um, as far as reduces busy work, that's a reference more to uh, stacks of paper, busy work, weekend grading, where it doesn't take a lot of time for each paper, but you have a lot of them. Most of that is eliminated um, in a project-based course. Campus and greater local community. Um, providing opportunities for community members to connect with international student population. Now, obviously, the result is going to be an increase in intercultural competence, or at least the opportunity. Um, living, in, living in Cedar City, it's a relatively small city. It's about a population of about 30,000 in rural southern Utah. So many of our student population, much of our student population or uh, members of our, our community may have not had the opportunity of the means to travel internationally. And getting our students out into the community, both campus and larger Cedar City, the city community, really gives everyone an opportunity to learn about people from multicultural backgrounds and also from diverse countries. We have many, many countries represented, and it's a wonderful opportunity for our community. I'd like to finish uh, my section of the presentation by uh, talking about this quote. And I'm specifically uh, going to just talk about the bolded sections. I'm going to skip to the, to the end here. The cla creating a classroom culture of creativity and engagement. Share, reflect. Uh, these, these are integral to creating a successful project-based course. Uh, building a culture of trust. Um, building a classroom where students feel comfortable making mistakes, feel, uh, being unsuccessful, but yet then supporting each other uh, with their own skills that they're discovering. Um, creating a culture in a classroom, a community of practice, uh, is very important to the success of a project-based uh, classroom. So thank you very much, and I'm going to now pass the presentation over to my colleague, Sylvia Kozlovska, who's going to show you um, what these projects look like in practice. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, my name is Sylvia Kozlowska, and I will be sharing a sample project with you to illustrate how we implemented project-based learning in our intensive English program. Uh, so first, let me give you a little bit of context, a little overview of this service learning project. Um, in this case, this was the students' very first time to, to work on any kind of project. They had no experience with project-based learning. And in cases like this, I highly recommend doing some kind of a primer project with the students or a model project in the first week uh, of the project-based course. In our case, it took just one instructional day, so it was about four contact hours to do a poverty simulation that our local chamber of commerce put on. So we prepared for this simulation and students um, participated in the poverty simulation by assuming different worker roles in the community. Uh, so there was a high level of interaction with members from the local community. Uh, later when we returned to the classroom, um, we reflected together. We had kind of a social discussion reflection uh, and we identified various language and transferable skills that were used during this primer activity, during this poverty simulation. Um, and in doing so, the students are identifying their strengths, their growth areas, as well as next steps. And those next steps help them with that sustained inquiry because um, they're identifying other places in the community where they might want to volunteer or other people in the community who are in need of some help. So essentially this one day primer um, um, gives students a preview of the expectations and the process of, of successfully completing their own upcoming multi-week projects. Um, the image on the right side from Buck Institute of Education um, shows seven essential uh, 
project design elements that you can see addressed in the tasks on the left side that students were asked to complete uh, for this project. SU has over 70 community partners, and so there was plenty to choose from. Um, in this class, every team of three students chose three places to volunteer. So a total of nine um, places visited by, by the class. Um, and some of the types of things students did, um, they worked with shelter animals, uh, they weeded the local cemetery, they played games with residents as, at a local senior center, and they played softball with youth with disabilities. Um, each team, like I said, volunteered at three different places and um, definitely had a positive impact on the community. Um, I'd like to share with you some of these umbrella topics. In my experience, I, I found these themes to be very helpful, especially when students have never done a project or never had autonomy in choosing such topics. Uh, these umbrella topics are helpful for a couple of reasons. So, uh, one, they give students kind of a starting point uh, when they have no experience of selecting a topic based on their interests. And also in my experience as an instructor, when I am intentional about choosing um, a theme and choosing a primer project for that theme, then that seems to increase students' motivation and just inquisitiveness in, in general about the topic. And so when it comes time for them to select their individual subtopics under the umbrella, um, it's a, it's a bit easier for them that way. The sample project timeline here is a seven week one. Uh, as I mentioned with the poverty simulation, we did that in week one as a primer. Um, and so in week two, teams submitted their project proposals. Uh, and for these proposals, they selected a subtopic uh, under the umbrella of, in this case, service work. They also identified the purpose of their project, uh, the intended audience for their project, um, and they uh, also identified how they would like to share the project publicly at the end, for what kind of product, oral and written product, would they like to develop because that, that's a requirement in our program. Um, some of the skills that we worked on were um, skills such as uh, creating effective survey questions, approaching strangers, so a little bit of intercultural uh, competence there, uh, analyzing results, and uh, reflections are built in to each progress update assignment. So for example, secondary research questions, plus that, that's a progress update assignment. Primary research questions plus, plus results, that's another uh, progress update assignment. And so each progress update has a reflection built in, and then there is a final course reflection uh, that students complete in week seven. Um, here I'm, uh, I'm sharing some guiding questions for topic selection. I do think students need guidance when they select topic, uh, whether they're selecting a subtopic of a theme or their original topic. Uh, you can see a few examples of guiding questions on the right side here that help them brainstorm. And the important thing really here to remember is that the project should be about themselves. They should do it for themselves first and foremost, and, and then identify who else this project might help. Uh, so to share the written component of this service learning project, the nine students decided together uh, that they would like to, to, to do that in a, in a booklet. Um, and so they created this booklet. This is an excerpt from a couple pages where one of the teams reorganized a storage area with a ton of donated items at Family Support Center of South Southwestern Utah. Um, so the requirements for each volunteer experience in the booklet were, were agreed upon by these nine students. So they decided that each entry should have an introduction paragraph, a benefits paragraph, and some kind of contact. Um, the photos and captions are there because I kind of required it. I asked them to document their experience, take photos, videos. And then uh, we also practiced with writing questions, which was uh, good practice for staying concise. Uh, I'll share with you a couple excerpts from students' final course reflections that they also included on this last page um, of the booklet. 
And some of the things that stand out to me here are just, you know, we should reflect on the value of our lives, develop empathy, collaborate more, compromise, and smile more at other people. So I think they really had a positive experience um, and definitely the, the community benefited. Here's one more statement I love on the right, what Simon, what Simon shared. If you want your team to be better, then you should have leadership and patience and self-discipline. So more transferable skills there. Um, another thing that students need guidance with is selecting how they would like to share their final project in terms of the written and oral products. Um, and so I usually give them a list very much like this, um, this one plus a little more, that they can select different genres from, or they can select a genre that's not on the list, you know, and run it by me. Um, so something to consider is that you can tell a lot of these will need some technology skills. And so just keep that in mind as students make the choices. Here on the left, you can see our students publicly sharing their products, um, their project products um, during an end of term mini conference, which is a time when everyone from our program gets together. Um, we have some snacks and students share what they've been working on this term. We invite faculty and, and administrators from the program and it's just a fun way to conclude a term. Uh, the middle photo was taken during another primer project. In this case, we were working with the You Matter campaign. So students were putting together care packages and inspirational notes for, for You Matter campaign. Uh, and the, the theme for this project was the eight dimensions of personal wellness, uh, with this being the primer. Um, on the right, you can see uh, some collaboration between intensive English program students and nutrition students from SUU. Uh, so students shared recipes, they watched food demos from students from nutrition, um, they cooked together, ate together, um, and just, just had a great time learning how to cook some basic meals for college students. Um, and we also got to work with the SU Community Garden. We got to uh, prepare the soil for that garden, and that was a ton of fun. Uh, briefly, I want to share three more slides uh, from three original student projects that the topics were chosen completely independently of any umbrella theme. So this is just what students chose based on those guiding questions that I showed you earlier. Um, so here is a student who um, struggled with playing video games and it was starting to hurt his, his grades. And so he decided to do a project and create this little infographic to share with other students, international or domestic, who might struggle with this issue. This student heard a rumor when she first moved to uh, Cedar City that Cedar City is boring because there is no nightlife. So she set out to experiment and find out whether that was true and put together this little brochure for other students to let them know, hey, there's things to do around here. And this last one uh, was a collaboration between four students from the same course um, who decided to put together a website that informs other future students in these majors about the majors. So EMMA stands for Education, Management, Marketing, and Accounting. They came up with this catchy little name. And um, for each major, they're sharing things like just an overview of types of courses, uh, but also related careers, the job outlook, and tips and tricks from degree-seeking students enrolled in these majors. So, so students from this class interviewed those students and included the tips and tricks here. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that um, this presentation encourage you, encourages you to use projects in your class, and please reach out if you have any questions. Next, my colleague Mark Makino will talk to you a little bit about challenges associated with project-based learning. Hi, I'm Mark Makino. I'm another full-time lecturer in the ALCC and SUU. I'm going to talk about some challenges uh, that we've had in implementing PBL, some challenges that you might also have, and some adaptations that we've made that you might also make in your program. So one challenge a lot of people face in implementing TBL is that uh, let's see, 
due to a variety of reasons, but especially during COVID um, drops in international enrollment, you might be combining a PBL course, a course that's been decided as a PBL course uh, with a course that's not PBL. In my case, it's a TBL or task-based learning course. A course that's in its official description is you know, described as task-based. Um, and, but you can also imagine that you might have to combine a PBL course with something else like a traditional grammar course or something like that. And in any of those cases, you might make some adaptations. Some of them may be similar to the ones I'm gonna to describe to your PBL course. So um, again, um, I said again, but maybe this is the first time you're hearing this, a project-based level in our system, in our program is um, the even numbered levels that you see here. They go from, well, there's a level below one also, but let's just say we start with one and the odd levels are all task-based, the even levels are all project-based, which means that when you're combining two classes, there's a high likelihood that you'll be combining a task-based and a project-based level together. So um, say you have, you, you might have two project-based levels that are combined and it seems like I'm gonna be teaching a class like that next term, but um, in our system, at least, it's much more likely that adjacent levels will, will be combined, which means that you'll have a task-based and a project-based level that have to be taught in the same room by the same teacher, you know, basically simultaneously together. Yes, that's what those words mean. Um, and that means basically you'll need to make some accommodations to one of the courses. And in, in let's see, because this presentation is about PBL, I'm gonna talk about uh, making changes to the PBL course. So just to um, recap the difference between task-based and project-based learning, and you might already be very familiar with this, but basically a project-based course consists of various tasks which culminate in a project right which are part of a cohesive whole and a task-based course doesn't necessarily uh, work towards a larger whole right so they both consist of tasks but in a project-based class the tasks are part of a project whereas in a task-based class they're not um, as the quote says, um, the defining feature of a project-based course is that there, there's, a, a, there's a goal at the end, a goal other than just having a lot of points, right? Um, so this can be a concern as you don't want the task-based class or the, you know, the non-project-based class to be a separate community within your classroom. You want both classes to be able to cooperate for the purposes of sharing information, offering each other feedback, uh, being a good audience for presentations, things like that. Um, you don't want half the class you know, in the computer lab while the other half is giving presentations or something like that um, because you're losing more peers who could feasibly provide useful feedback or at least just uh, you know, uh, someone to listen to your presentation, et cetera. Um, my adaptation is to modify the project-based level, again, because we're talking about PBL here, um, to give it a narrower scope to match the other class that it's, met, that it's being taught with, and or prescribe a schedule to the PBL course that's a bit more restrictive than a normal PBL schedule would be just to match it to the other course. So um, as an example um, of narrowing the topic for a project-based level, say initially you you want them all to talk about habits and already this is an accommodation because uh, a pure project-based course you wouldn't tell them necessarily what to study although I, as we've seen um, a lot of people already do this for other reasons already restrict the topics for pbl for other reasons um, in my class though because my other class the other class that i usually teach my project-based level with um, is using this particular book, which I've used for many years in my um, academic uh, ESL classes. Um, I basically just tell the PBL class that they have to use this book too. And this is an accommodation because you know I'm taking more and more steps away from a pure project-based level as I do this. I go a step further and tell them which chapters they have to use and the project-based and the class, the uh, task-based classes have to read these chapters at the same time. 
And then after they're done reading these chapters, the project-based levels begin their chapters with the caveat that they have to use this particular book as a lens for analysis of whatever they find, right? So it's a pretty big accommodation uh, away from pro pure project-based learning. Um, and then along similar lines, so I mentioned that my task-based level and my project-based level are both reading the same book at the same time. This helps to make sure that they're on the same page metaphorically. The project-based level and the task-based level do their reading together in reading circles. Um, and this helps make sure they have a common vocabulary and a common understanding of the basic disciplinary concepts uh, that they'll be using for the rest of the class. And for the rest of the semester, they're following similar, but uh, not exactly the same schedules. So for example, when one group is doing their present, when the project based level are presenting their projects publicly, you know, sharing their projects with the rest of the class, um, the task based levels are listening to their projects and then peer evaluating them as well um, and looking critically for their use of the, the disciplinary concepts that we learned from the book much earlier. Um, in the course, right? And so uh, basically I want the, 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 the two classes that are meeting together in the same room at the same time to be able to help each other and having them do similar, although not exactly the same things at the same, same, at the same time <laughs> helps facilitate this, this process, right? So to make explicit which aspects of PBL I'm, I'm changing here, um, when I make this accommodation, I'm reducing the amount of autonomy that the students have. Um, they don't, you know, in the example that I gave earlier, they don't have a choice of topics. They don't even have a choice of lenses. And this is really just in the name of having a cohesive class. So I reduce the autonomy and increase the cohesiveness of the class because they're all talking about the same thing. Okay. So another challenge you might face in your um, classes uh, implementing PBL in your particular context is that your students might be used to teacher focused classes and indeed they might explicitly say they prefer teacher focused classes teacher centered classes or in scare quotes traditional language classes. Um, just to outline how this is different from PBL, although I'm sure. Um, let's see if you've ever taught in an EFL context or taught ESL students who are recently in an EFL context, you're pretty familiar with uh, what kind of language classes they probably had. Basically, there's no process of inquiry. The students never choose what to study next. Whatever you study next was chosen by a government agency probably decades ago. Uh, and the teacher acts as if it's natural that everyone wants to know the answer to those questions and then just tells you the answers, right? So there's no real process of inquiry. That's why inquiry is also in scare quotes here. There's probably no public sharing of work either. Um, and then the assessment, once the assessment is complete, there's no chance to sort of recoup your investment by reflecting on a failed project or a failed, you know, um, task. I don't even know what to call what the equivalent unit of time is in a teacher centered classroom, but um, you can't fail the test and then reflect on it and get some points for the reflection. Basically, when you fail, you just fail. And in PBL, the reflection is really the point even more than the project. Um, if a project doesn't go well, say students are trying to do research and they don't get many answers to their questionnaire or something, that in and of itself is a very you know, ripe piece of fruit for reflection and, and thinking about. Um, and you could make as many, you could get as many points for that as for a survey that goes swimmingly with a hundred respondents. Um, but you know, in a traditional classroom that whole idea does not exist. Anyway, so um, some researchers have found that students explicitly prefer teacher-centered classes both in EFL and in ESL. I used to teach in Japan and I know a lot of students really want to know what comes next. And that's part of the comfort of being in a teacher-centered class is knowing that there's someone in the classroom who knows exactly what you're supposed to do next. Um, but in, in an ESL context too, our students might not be in this educational culture while they're in the US, right? They're not necessarily in a teacher-centered educational culture while they're in the US with us, but they very recently were, um, in our case, in an IEP, our students come here and the first semester that they're with us is often the very first time they've ever heard of, you know, student projects or choosing their own thing to study, right? 
Um, so it's not a surprise that students often actually express fondness for the way that they used to be taught. Uh, and because of the way that, let's say, the way a teacher-centered classroom works, where someone in class always knows what to do next, students are often very hesitant to take the first step in whatever direction they're supposed to choose for their projects. So the accommodation that I have for uh, students who are used to teacher-centered classes is basically uh, oriented towards getting them to take the first step with as little resistance as possible, or basically making the first step as clear as possible for them. Okay, so I call this making the subtext text and giving it points. Make the subtext text means explicitly delineate all the steps you need to take in order to accomplish some part of your project and give each one of those steps a separate assignment and separate points attached to it. Um, so as an example, let's say as part of their project, you want them to go to the library and choose three books on their topic, whatever their topic might be. So you might thin slice that into bite-sized chunks, such as, you know, walk in the library door and notice that someone is sitting at something called a help desk, write down their name, right? And, you know, in practice, usually this leads to some kind of conversation with them too, which is gravy. Um, basically, you're taking all the parts that someone who's already done library research already knows how to do and, you know, giving them an official name, making each of the you know, the steps on the way to their ultimate project completion, the left, right, left, right, um, giving each of those explicit instructions. And, and when I say give them points, I mean, quite literally, either on, you know, a worksheet, if you're still giving people pieces of paper during COVID, or on your LMS, give them all separate assignment names, and uh, give them each separate points so that students will get a notification whenever it's time to go to the library and, you know, talk to the person at the help desk. Right. So again, this is an accommodation away from the pure principles of PBL. Specifically, you're reducing learner autonomy a lot. So you're not giving them the space to make as many mistakes or the space to flounder, which, you know, um, can be a very valuable part of PBL. Uh, and you're taking some of that away in, um, let's see, in the name of further, you know, greater clarity and reducing the odds that things will go catastrophically wrong and nothing will ever get done, which does happen. And, you know, again, if you have all, you have a lot, if you have a lot more time, I can't, I get those words out. Um, this could be a valuable part of the lesson in project-based learning, but um, sometimes you just have to get things done and on a specific day. Um, you're also switching the teacher role a bit. The teacher's no longer a facilitator if the teacher's telling you, you know, left to right, left first, and then right, and then left again, and then right. Um, you're, in, um, you're shifting more to a traditional teacher role by doing this, and also increasing the amount of work you have. You have to make all those separate lines in your LMS and give them all points and give them assignment descriptions and, and things like that. So you're increasing your busy work too, uh, basically in the name of increasing the likelihood of success, right? Success maybe should be in scare quotes here too, um, but it is an accommodation. So I want, I want to make that clear. Okay. So the next few slides will be from my colleague, Kirsten. Hi, my name is Kirsten Stevens, and I am going to be addressing a couple of challenges that you may face with your program in implementing project-based learning. One being that students with very low levels of English proficiency may really struggle to complete projects. Um, authentic situations for them that are usually required for doing project-based learning can be very overwhelming if they're not ready for the vocabulary. They don't, they don't know what people are gonna be saying and they're not maybe prepared for the situation. They can be pretty overwhelmed by them or they may lack confidence because they know their level is a little bit lower. They, we often have found that our students that are in lower levels in our program don't have the metacognitive ability to, to, to go through projects and to talk about, okay, what, what, what's going well, what's not going well, and writing up proposals and things that are just a little bit more advanced tend to be pretty tricky. An adaptation that we've made, um, several adaptations that we've made include modifying the scope. So taking project-based learning and, and trying to narrow it just a little bit um, in several different ways, or doing something collaborative and completing a project as a class. So in narrowing the scope, a couple of things that we've done are assigning one of these umbrella topics or themes to say, okay, instead of 
going out into the world and choosing any question or problem that you want to talk about or, or investigate, let's focus on health or let's focus on um, campus activities or let's focus on you know, something kind of smaller like food. So taking all of these possible topics and narrowing down just a little bit can help it be a little bit less overwhelming and it can help you provide resources. So incorporating the second point here that if you know that everyone is going to be investigating clubs, you can prepare a little bit, um, maybe a reading that everybody can do, or you can scout through clubs web pages and find a page that may be written in global English or is at least more accessible for your students. Um, so by taking this, by narrowing the scope a little bit and taking this huge possible range of topics down to something a little bit more manageable, you can try to mitigate some of those problems of feeling overwhelmed and not being ready or maybe not having the confidence. Um, mini projects, uh, another one, uh, mini projects are something that we've done in lots of different ways. Uh, and mini projects can be used even with a more advanced group to just show them what you want them to be doing and model it, but can be extremely successful for lower level learners. So an example of making a mini project is doing uh, a project in a day that we do with our campus art museum. So within our class period, they're, they're longer periods, we have about four, four and a half hours a day with our students. Uh, within that time, we can go through the whole project from start to finish in just a condensed format to show them what we're doing and to kind of walk them through the stages. So we can start together by looking at, you know, let's think about all of the questions that we have about the campus art museum and maybe finding some topic together that we can investigate and then going over to the museum together as a class, investigating our question or questions and then coming back to class after our real in-person investigation, talking to the people there, walking around, seeing what they have, checking the website and any of these things that we've done, then we'll come back to the classroom and produce something, maybe make a flyer about the art museum or make a 30 second commercial about the art museum. So we come back to the classroom and then do something to present what we've found through our inquiry and then finish class with, a, with a, a group discussion and reflection on what happened in our, in our experience with this mini project. Um, another way that I've done that is with students investigating clubs or activities, resources on campus. Um, with this particular class, this mini project was a week long project. And we started the first stage as brainstorming questions they had about campus. So where can you eat on campus or what kinds of food are available on campus? Um, where can you find movies or what kinds of activities are there? Uh, where can you find you know, people to get involved with? And someone in the class wanted to talk about clubs. And so this project turned into just an investigation. She asked all of her friends and roommates and friends' friends about clubs they had joined on campus and presented her findings with a, a Two, I think there were maybe three or four slides in this PowerPoint, and then she wrote a little paragraph um, report after. And it just, the scope was narrow enough and it seemed you know, doable enough that it was pretty accessible for her, even though she was in one of the lower levels. And with group projects, really just like you might divide up anything to divide and conquer, come up with a topic together as a class divide it up and have either students in, on their own or in pairs investigate or collect information about that thing. Um, one that I've done, again, with a lower level class uh, was learning about all of the campus resources that are available and especially relevant to international students. So we brainstormed questions that we had, where can you, you know, where can you get help with your writing on campus? Where can you get help with speaking on campus? What if you want to have questions answered about the you know, student email server, or other things that may be especially relevant like I-20s. So we, we brainstormed all of these questions that we had and broke students up into small groups to go visit offices on campus and find out what services they have there and if they can get help with their speaking, if they can get help with their I-20s. So they went to these offices, took pictures of the office and then came back and wrote just a short little paragraph or two about what the, what the, what the office is and what, what it does. 
And then we printed off these pamphlets and put them in the, in our office. And I still will grab one off the wall and hand it to a new student. If they ask me, I, who can help me set up my student email? And I say, oh, the, the Nest would love to help you do that. In fact, let me give you this resource pamphlet, this brochure that some of our students made. And it has all the information right here, the room number and, and when they're open and you can go check it out. This is a compromise. It's not truly project-based learning in the fullest definition of students guiding their own inquiry. This is a compromise. If you narrow the scope or if you do something together as a group, learners aren't completely engaging in the self-directed process of inquiry. They're not getting the full experience of doing something that's a true project. Um, but it, it's one of the trade-offs that, that you make that you say, well, if they're really, really low, they may not be able to do that anyway and get all of those benefits anyway. So if they're not going to get any of those benefits, then by making these adaptations, they could at least get some of them. So the compromise here, yes, it's a compromise. It's not truly project-based, but they're still getting involved in real questions that they can have. They can guide it to some extent um, and they can still get a lot of the, a lot of the same benefits. Another challenge may be that it takes a lot of time and it does, it can take a lot of time for students to start from the very beginning and go through the whole world of possibilities and choose a topic and make a proposal and submit the proposal and get the proposal approved and then start investigating and finding their sources. And it can take a long time. And if you are looking to get some of the benefits of project-based learning, but can't dedicate all of the time to it, some of those same adaptations could help you. Um, modifying with a narrower scope or maybe doing a project together as a class. Um, you're still going to be connecting all of these individual things together into a project. It's not just making it a task, um, but you could do a mini project to do a project in a day, do a project in a week. You can do a project together as a group um, and still get some of these same benefits. Again, making a compromise that you're not going to be completely stepping aside and letting the learners direct everything, but they can still be involved in, in a good portion and they should be involved in a good portion of, of decision-making and guiding the process where you can let them. And a final challenge may be that teachers aren't really sure what to do in a project-based classroom. And, and if you're switching or transitioning or you have teachers that you're hiring that aren't coming from a background of using project-based learning, this is huge. This is where I was coming from when I came to SUU. Um, I was somewhat familiar with it, but I had definitely never done a project-based curriculum in the truest sense of a project-based curriculum. And there are lots of questions that teachers have, and you are going to want to consider how to answer these questions for your teachers um, as you implement project-based learning. Um, an adaptation that we found very helpful here, I personally found very, very helpful, is increasing access to mentors and observations, trainings, and reflection. Um, it didn't have to be always formal. Some of the things that helped me the most were just the casual conversations that you start before a meeting where someone says, well, I have this question and I don't know what to do with a student who's working on this particular project and kind of hearing people bounce around ideas and, and how they've tackled certain questions or issues before, uh, as well as watching another, another teacher going into a classroom that's being you know, in that first week when students are, are starting and setting up the project really helped me see, okay, this is what we're trying to accomplish. So that is an, an adaptation that may be helpful. And while we're not gonna try to answer these questions for you because there's quite a bit of individualization here, you, your program will decide what this looks like for you, depending on the other things that you have involved in your curriculum. Um, but topics that you'll want to consider for teacher trainings and things that you'll want to make sure that you've decided on as before you implement, so that as you're training, you can help teachers answer these questions are in how to envision their role as a guide on the side and making the classroom really more student-centered, helping, helping teachers understand how to use class time effectively and what you want them to be doing with class time, and kind of connected to that, where mini lessons come in, um, how to teach them and how to find mini lessons that benefit the group uh, or how to maybe break up into different groups and have a mini lesson for this group while you know, it applies to what they're doing and maybe these students don't need that or something, but that's a topic that you'll want to consider is helping and helping teachers know when and where and how they can, they can do many lessons 
and making sure that students still reach course outcomes. Um, that's an easy thing for teachers to lose sight of when you're going into something that's completely new for them. And if they're coming into project-based learning or transitioning into project-based learning without a strong foundation, it's easy to, to get kind of overwhelmed by this big thing and say, okay, I got to get this project thing figured out. And they can kind of forget that they still have outcomes that they're working towards and, or, or, or maybe they've pushed off evaluating them or finding good ways to assess the outcomes because they're so worried about the project. So that's another good topic to make sure that teachers are aware of good ways. It's not different. Um, we're still working on outcomes. We're just doing it through a project and helping them see that. This compromise is maybe more a compromise that the, the program needs to be willing to make as far as priorities and, and scheduling and funding maybe is not a, a compromise to project-based learning, but the, the program will have to decide how much time and money they're willing to invest in formal training and in arranging for people to be maybe more informal mentors and just check in on, on colleagues who may be working. We want to thank you for participating in our video and learning more about project-based learning. If you have any questions or comments about how to implement project-based learning in your intensive English program, please reach out to us. Our email addresses are provided here uh, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you.